welcome and uh, a wonderful welcome to all our regular members as well on this beautiful fall Sunday morning. I just want to thank um, Barb for all the work she does every week. She carries these planters from home, puts them in her vehicle, and brings them into church so that we can enjoy God's beautiful creation inside the building too. And I just want to thank her for all the work that she does. And I'm really looking forward to the fall display, so pressure's on. <laughs> I, I have no announcements for, um, for the coming week, but I uh, pray that God will, will be with us. And uh, sorry, someone was waving to me back there. Is there something I'm supposed to say? Oh, okay. Um, anyway, a uh, blessed uh, week ahead. And as we uh, go about our, our work and our schooling and our daily lives, may God go with us and bless us in this coming week. Let us prepare our hearts and our minds for worship, and as the praise team will help us with our opening songs. Could you stand with us in body or in spirit? Just a minute, just a minute. Just a minute. Call to work, or call to worship. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, is there responsive on the screen at all? Okay. We gather together to celebrate the joy in our lives. God's love fills our hearts to overflowing with laughter. We gather in God's presence to find comfort and hope for our pain. God's grace wipes away our tears and knits us together as one people. We gather together in God's presence to worship God in faith and in truth. Alleluia. Amen.
Good morning, and welcome. Our God greets us. Grace to you and peace from God our Father the Lord and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to set us free from the present evil age. According to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever, and all God's people say, Amen. You may be seated. God reconciles himself to us. Let's go to him in a prayer of confession. O oh, gentle, gentle shepherd, you guide us in right paths. You lead us in the ways of righteousness. But we have allowed our anger our rage, our greed, and at times even hate to direct our paths. We have overreacted. We have taken more than our fair share. And we have despised others that seem to have it all. So forgive us, O oh God, for not following your ways. Forgive us for not remembering that we are your sheep and you are our shepherd. Forgive us when we have not listened for your voice and instead have listened to the voice of this world. Guide us back to your path, to loving you and to loving our neighbors as we love ourselves. Help us to unclench our fists and stretch out our hands in hope and in healing, in forgiveness and in love. And it's in the name of, our, of Christ, our shepherd, that we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we have honestly confessed our sins, and so we gladly receive the much-needed good news. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The good shepherd knows the sheep, and the good shepherd dies for his sheep so that his sheep may live. We are part of the flock. We are part of Christ's body. In Christ alone we find wholeness and healing and restoration. Go forth and share this blessed assurance. Amen. Could you join us in standing in body and spirit? <laughs>
one of those hymns I definitely want at my funeral service. Beautiful hymn. Boys and girls who are here and boys and girls that might be watching online, do you ever play a game where someone can't get by without giving you a password? Now, if you are the person who needed the password, you are acting like a gatekeeper where the gate would swing open wide if the person gets the correct password. Well, that's what we're going to be talking about today as Jesus is the gatekeeper. And guess what the password is to get into Jesus' kingdom? Well, it's Jesus. He is the gate. He is the password. He is the key. And he is the only way. So all we have to do to get into Jesus' kingdom is to call on the name of Jesus and to follow him because there is no name under heaven or in earth where we can be saved. So I hope you boys and girls will remember that and be encouraged by that this week. We're going to go to our God now in the prayers of the people. Lord God and Heavenly Father, it's good for us to hear the voices and the laughter of our children. Lord, we long for the day when this place will be filled again with your people and your children and we can even come to the front, gather around and share stories and fellowship and laughter with our precious gifts that you've given to us. Lord, this global COVID pandemic continues to unveil sharp inequities between and within nations. Governments have been discredited and citizens disillusioned. May the decisions of our world leaders be informed by your divine wisdom. Fill them with humility and compassion, not fear and greed. Help them to see our interconnectedness and interdependence. We pray for all those making difficult decisions during this weary an uncertain time. Ruler of all the nations, we long for the day when swords will be beaten into plowshares. Descend upon the many corners of this world in need of your saving love and of your abiding peace. We pray for your children in Myanmar, near the Indian border, who have had to flee their homes because of increased fighting. We pray for all those whose daily lives are dictated by survival amid war and terror. We pray for your children in Afghanistan where the Taliban have refused to include women in their cabinet, not to mention girls not allowed to return to high school. We pray for all those who are oppressed and targeted because of their gender. Lord God, when it comes to refugees, let us repent of all the ways we fail to see you in one another. May all who are fleeing violence and trauma find people and communities and nations that will nurture them, protect them, strengthen them, and free them. Father God, we, in our church family, we continue to lift up hands and hearts for Ryan and Erica and their family. We continue to seek re your restoration and your healing. 
and give us that sustained and continued patience as we wait upon you. We also pray for Jim Haas and for Grace. As Jim remains in hospital due to a progression of his dementia, O oh Lord, so many in this church family are so familiar with the devastating effects that come with dementia in all its forms. Please help us to, to cope knowing that even if we forget our loved ones and we forget you, that you cannot and will not ever forget us. And that our names are engraved on the palms of your hands. They are ever before you. O oh Lord, we count on your divine love. Your love that helps us bear all things, believe all things, hope all things, and endure all things, as the Apostle Paul reminds us. Let us hold fast and firm to this piece of wonderfully good news. May it be our beacon of light as we find our way through this life. And all God's children say, Amen. As Diane is Coming forward for the scripture reading, I just want to set the context for that reading from John 10. Kind of ties closely together with John 9. I'm not going to read it, but just kind of go over it. It's the story where Jesus heals the man that has been born blind. And uh, that man is interrogated by the Pharisees, eventually kicked out of the church, but who has an encounter with Jesus and is never the same again. So that sets the text, the tone, or in the scene for the reading of God's Word. The reading of God's Word, John 10, 1 to 10. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Brothers and sisters, before we begin, I'd like to like for you to watch this short video. Burglary in Florida ended with an unusual rescue. Cell phone video shows the suspect stuck in a chimney with his foot dangling above the fireplace. His accomplice had to call police for help. It took rescuers more than an hour to hoist the man out using straps and a harness. The homeowner said his valuables were safe, but the chimney rescue left quite a mess behind. It seems that these two guys have not read John chapter 10 very recently. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen 
by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. Now, we can easily laugh at some of these world's dumbest criminals, but Jesus has here some different thieves in mind. These particular thieves aren't stupid at all. They even have the keys to the building that they are entering through some other way. They are the ones who are supposed to be in the know about kingdom things. They are the seers of their day. The ones who will point their fellow Jews to the king. The one who will usher in the kingdom of God. But it turns out these Pharisees, these church leaders, are blind. What the blind man saw, they could not see. Standing in front of them was the the door to the kingdom. More than the door, it was the king himself. But they did not recognize him. They were too busy preaching Sabbath observance each and every Sabbath that they didn't even notice the Lord of the Sabbath, the one who healed a man born blind on the Sabbath. A man who was born this way not because of sin, but so that the works of God might be displayed in him. A blind man who met the king and came away from that encounter forever changed. The blind man could physically see for the first time and came to see and believe that Jesus is the king. He is the gate to the kingdom. A kingdom where blindness turns to sight and where sacrifice gives way to wide-open mercy. Now, this kingdom might be wide-open and tolerant when it comes to who can enter, but it is very narrow, very intolerant when it comes to how one enters enters. There is only one entrance, one address for the kingdom, and that is one Jesus Christ way. If we try to get in any other way, we are a thief and a robber. And it doesn't matter if we are a Pharisee or a pastor a synagogue ruler, or an elder or deacon. Earthly status means squat when it comes to entrance to the kingdom. John 9, 39, Jesus says, For judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Strange. But what Jesus means is that if we claim to be in the kingdom, but don't even recognize the king, then we're blind. Immediately after saying this, some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what, are we blind too? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. And guilty people get judged, everyone. It's innocent people who are set free. Oh, but Pastor John, no one is innocent. We are all guilty of sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. How then can we ever get in? Great question. 
Maybe like the church leaders of Jesus' day, I'll call them the other wayers for short. We can try to get in some other way. But maybe we should listen to what Jesus has to say first. Whenever Jesus starts off by saying, truly, truly, or I tell you the truth, he is summing up something that he was just talking about. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The sheep pen represents the needy people of God. Both those inside the church and those outside the church, important for us to remember. People like the blind man of chapter 9, not so much his physical blindness, but his spiritual blindness. These needy people need little s shepherds, lowercase shepherds, who will introduce them to the capital S shepherd, the uppercase good shepherd, the long-awaited Messiah, the anointed one, the king of the kingdom. But when the blind man comes before these little s shepherds, the Pharisees, singing Jesus' praises, they don't praise along with him. They boot him straight out of the church. He's excommunicated. Brothers and sisters, we certainly live in a video generation. We love those interesting little videos like the world's dumbest criminals. But I can imagine this little stunt by the Pharisees went viral in heaven. Hey, Gabriel, hey, Michael, check this one out. Jesus heals a man born blind who then sings Jesus' praises and he gets kicked out of the church for it. Talk about the world's dumbest church leaders. I think I'll label this one blind guides. These blind guides were so interested in keeping God's laws that they missed their own biblical lawgiver. They missed the gate, the door of Scripture. And then, then there's that ironic twist. The blind man becomes the representative shepherd. The blind man becomes the one mentioned in verse 2 of our text. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The blind man sees the Messiah. The blind man becomes the perfect, faithful shepherd by pointing so consistently and faithfully and truthfully to Jesus Christ. Again and again, even against strong opposition. The Pharisees are so blinded by their enforcement of other biblical themes, even good themes like Sabbath observance, one of God's gracious laws, that they couldn't see the essential theme of both, both Scripture and life. God's Messiah for needy people. If you hear anything today, hear that. God's Messiah for needy people. And what do needy people need? 
They need the good shepherd. But since Jesus isn't physically with us here, we need little shepherds to make this a living reality. In this part of the text, Jesus is speaking about little shepherds, under shepherds. In verse 2 where it says, the shepherd, it could just as easily be translated a shepherd because there is no definite article in the Greek here like there is clearly in verse 11 when Jesus switches the analogy from himself, for himself, from the gate to the good shepherd. But right here, brothers and sisters, what Jesus is doing is inviting us all to be little shepherds, gate people, gatewayers, like the blind man, not other wayers like the Pharisees. We are called to be trustworthy little shepherds to whatever people God has entrusted us with. Whether that be our children, our neighbors, our employees, our brothers and sisters in Christ, whomever God has entrusted us to be a shepherd. So what does it look like to be a little shepherd? Well, they come to their sheep with only one concern, one message, one purpose. The Lord Jesus Christ and his gracious relationship to a needy world. They introduce and they keep introducing the sheep to the gate. The one who came to save and to seek those who are lost. The one who will make all things new and right and beautiful again. Little shepherds are gatewayers with no other agenda, no other message, no other theme or emphasis. Gatewayers are not stuck in traditions made by people, but they are always on the lookout for creative new ways to introduce more sheep to the good, good shepherd. To gatewayers, it is all about Jesus Christ. What he said, what he says, what he did, what he does, what he will do, and most important of all, who he is. The gate through which all must enter to have abundant life. Look again at this blind man in chapter 9. Here is a great little shepherd. First off, he simply obeys Jesus' command and goes to the pool of Siloam and washes. And after being brought before the Pharisees, he is utterly loyal to Jesus and completely truthful throughout their interrogations. He honors Jesus as healer, verse 7. He protects Jesus from suspicion, verse 17. He speaks the truth about Jesus to the hostile environment. He is persecuted and even tossed out of the synagogue for being loyal to Jesus. And finally, after Jesus reveals himself completely, the blind man confesses himself to Jesus in faith, openly. He even bows down and worships Jesus in verse 38 of chapter 9. A fitting response for any little shepherd of the kingdom in front of their king, the good shepherd. 
Now, do we recognize the miracle here? Forget the fact that Jesus gave sight to a man born blind. Definitely a miracle. But look at the faith of this man who was given spiritual sight. Was this blind man simply smarter than the Pharisees or something? Was he better than they were in some way? Not at all. The Pharisees were right when they said this man was a sinner from birth. We all are. So what happened to this blind man? Verse 3 gives us the answer. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him. If we insert Jesus Christ for the gate and blind man for him, the verse would say, the gatekeeper opens Jesus Christ for the blind man. The gatekeeper must be the Holy Spirit. The one who regenerates the heart of the blind man and removes the spiritual scales from his eyes. It's the same Holy Spirit that removes the scales from our eyes. The same Holy Spirit who points us to Jesus Christ who reminds us of everything Jesus did did and spoke. The one who empowers us to be little shepherds in his kingdom. We've heard that phrase, the priesthood of all believers. In this text, we have the shepherdhood of all believers. Shepherdhood. Because we are called to be little shepherds, speaking the truth in love, preaching and pointing to Jesus Christ by our words and our actions. Now, if anyone is still having trouble with this teaching, you're not alone. John 10, verse 6, Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. So Jesus spells it out for them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. And in case the blind are also deaf, Jesus repeats this great I am statement in verse 9. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. In the Greek, the literal translation would be, I am the gate through me. Whoever enters will be saved through me. We make so much of salvation. Jesus here is making much of himself the way to salvation. The way to the truth. And the life. The entry point means everything. Now, here we have Jesus glorifying himself once again, but he does it because it's the plain, simple, and yet beautiful truth. Jesus is not about to apologize for the fact that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Do you want salvation? 
Do you want to be made right with God the Father, free from the guilt of sin? You get that through me, says Jesus. Are you interested in some Christian freedom and the joy that comes along with it? Look at the last half of verse 9. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. Pasture. That pasture, everyone, is freedom from guilt and trying to please God in our own strength and power. Another way we attempt to enter the kingdom. But that pasture is purpose and meaning for our lives. Brothers and sisters, it's almost through 2021. And we call this pernicious virus COVID 2019. During this time of unrelenting pandemic, when we are stalked not by some wolf we can see, but by a virus we cannot see. At a time when staying behind the gates of our houses offers some protection, but not certain protection. At a time where we argue and we fight so much over the best way to live through the middle of all this, do we ever need a shepherd? Do we ever need a shepherd? We need a shepherd and a living gate who can assure us again of his love, of his power, and of his protection, whatever may come. At a time when our helplessness stands out for us to see with startling clarity. Maybe we think that we are free-range sheep a lot of the time. Yes, during ordinary moments, we're quite proud of our own ability to take care of ourselves and our families. We are the breadwinners, the protectors, the bulwark against the wiles of this world. But then we hit the brick wall of our limitations and we realize we are not free-range sheep at all. So we rightfully pine again for the one who alone can stay with us through all of our experiences. And so happy are we when we hear the voice of the shepherd again. The one who calls us back into his pen to stay behind this living gate through which nothing can final can harm us or those that we love. Surely this is the message the church needs right about now. A message that we need to share with this hurting and helpless and in many ways hopeless world. It all begins and it ends with Jesus. It's through me, says Jesus. You got to come through me. You ever see a movie or a TV show where one person is trying to get at another person, but there's a mediator in between that says, you can't get to them unless you go through me. Over my dead body will you get to them. That's exactly what Jesus is doing here. He's saying, over my dead body will you get 
salvation. You will get freedom from sin. And over my resurrected body, you'll get life too, abundant life. The green pasture life of Psalm 23. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul, my broken, hurting soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness. But for what purpose? For his namesake. That's what. For his namesake. Let's never forget. God is most magnified in us when we are most satisfied in him. John Piper quote. We are most satisfied in God when we put our hope and our trust in God's Messiah. It all begins and ends at one Jesus Christ way. The beautiful gate of Psalm 118, verse 20. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I like the way my old preaching prof, Scott Jose, puts it. All in all, what we find in John 10 and then in the rest of the wider gospel as well is a marvelous commingling of images. We have a living gate, a gate not of wood and steel, but of flesh and blood, a living gate that is swung aside not because some wood swings on hinges, but because Jesus' body was killed on the wood of a cross. Having been crucified and then raised, Jesus' new body has the wondrous ability to pass through doors and by baptism and the Lord's Supper that we hope to celebrate, God willing, next week to be passed through as the gateway to new life. As we leave this place this morning, let's remember that it was over Jesus' dead and resurrected body that we have life, abundant life, kingdom life, resurrection life. No world war, no depression, no flood, fire, or famine, and no pesky little pandemic can ever stop the kingdom from advancing and from the scene of Revelation 15 coming true. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Messiah. And he will reign forever and ever. And all God's people say, Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God and Father, we come before you Sometimes with a little bit of shame and guilt that lingers. Especially as we wander from your fold. We try the free range sheep option. And it backfires in our face as usual. But Lord God, we are so thankful that you sent your son, the Messiah, the good shepherd. Was it ever good to hear his voice again today? the voice of Jesus calling us back into his wonderful protection. Lord, we're thankful for the revelation of your scripture that through the power of the Holy Spirit opens up 
who takes the scales off of our blindness and helps us to, to see and to understand that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And Lord, also we thank you for your spirit who empowers us to be those little shepherds. Lord, strengthen us and guide us as we do that to all those who, are, who you've entrusted us with to shepherd. Lord, we do this for your name's sake, for your glory and honor. We pray it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
brothers and sisters are offering will be received on the way out, but they are for safe church ministries and our church budget and its ministries here at the church. Part of uh, being a good shepherd and part of being good under shepherds is having safe church policies that keep our children and all of us safe from predators who climb in through a different way and seek to harm and destroy. So we certainly want to honor those who present to us our safe church policy and, and follow all the procedures to make sure that everyone can worship here and learn and grow here in a safe place. Let's come to our God in prayer. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, what an undertaking and what a task and what a privilege, Lord, to balance, Lord, that tension between, between opening our arms wide to, to all who are seeking you and to all who know you, but also for putting up boundaries and protective barriers and arms crossed that this place is not a place for predators and those who seek to harm and destroy and hurt. Lord, so help us to have wisdom as we discern how best to carry this uh, balance out, Lord, where we are welcoming and loving but also protective. And that's another way we love each other, love our children, and love our community. Lord, we thank you for safe church ministries. We pray that you would bless uh, all that they do. We also give you thanks for this church, Lord, where we can still freely present the good news and, and as we seek to work towards uh, opening up programs again, Lord, we are still just discerning right now through uh, different conversations on how best we can open also to be safe for all of our, our members and all those who are involved in programs. So, Lord, I pray that you would give us um, you know, strength and wisdom as we go through that process to uh, open up our ministries more and more. And we just ask for your, you know, just for your strength and wisdom there. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, next week, the Lord willing, we will have our um, Lord's Supper service again. And in our tradition, uh, we view the Supper as more than just a memorial. It's certainly a memorial of uh, Christ's sacrifice and what he has done for us. But there's something mysterious that we believe that Christ's physical presence or his spiritual presence, I should say, is more, more it's a mysterious thing where that union that we have with Christ is intensified through that communion that we have together. Not only is our, our faith and the intensification of that union we have with Christ strengthened, it also is mysteriously our own union and our own um, yeah, unity is strengthened through that as well. So we're certainly looking forward, looking forward to, to celebrating the Lord's Supper together next week, and I just encourage those that are going to be doing that from home to just have their elements ready so that they can join us in, in spirit as well. We have a preparatory form I'd like to go through with you. As we prepare to celebrate Holy Communion next week, God willing, let us remember that Scripture calls us to examine ourselves before God. We are taught that eating and drinking unworthily brings judgment upon ourselves, let us therefore ask God for the proper spirit in which to celebrate the sacrament. Almighty God, before whom can be neither secret thought nor hidden deed, grant us your spirit that we may know our hearts, our lives, and our inmost thoughts as you know them. Grant us your grace that we may repent sincerely of all sin, find peace with you, through our Lord Jesus Christ and grow in assurance of salvation in him. May the celebration of our Savior's infinite love in his redeeming death bring joy to us and glory to you. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the atoning power of our Savior's death and for our share in his victory over sin. Open our hearts as we prepare for this celebration that it may strengthen us in our faith, establish us in our hope, and confirm us in our love. In his name, amen. Brothers and sisters, let us first examine our faith. We all confess the truth that God, of God as taught by Scripture and summarized in the creeds of the church. 
By this faith, we take to ourselves Christ and all his benefits, so that for us to live is Christ. Lord God, author and finisher of all true believing, confirm our faith as we prepare for the holy sacrament. Let us further examine our hope. All Christian hope rests upon the finished work of Christ as Savior. The Holy Gospel teaches that all our righteousness is in him alone. God's children rely wholly upon the merits of Christ, find in him their strength and victory, and confidently expect his return in glory. They look forward to celebrating this Holy Supper anew with him in the kingdom. They will surely be received by God at his table. Most merciful Father, Fill us with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may abound in hope. Let us also examine our love, both for God and our neighbors. Remember the great and first commandment to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Let us consciously determine to live a life of loving service to him through Christ our Lord. Let us also search ourselves to determine whether we love our neighbors as Christ commands. Do we unselfishly live for the welfare of others? Do our lives reflect the godly virtues of obedience, fidelity, integrity, justice, humility, and contentment? Do we seek reconciliation with our neighbors in all cases of offense? Dear Father, daily increase in us the greatest gift of all, our Christian love. If these marks of spiritual life are not evident in us, we may not presume to approach his table. Those, therefore, who live in self-righteousness, these are the other wayers, who hope in works or virtues of their own, and who do not show love to God and neighbor, have no true place at the Lord's Supper. Yet we should not be deterred by any sin lingering within against our will. As we find faith, hope, and love within us, we ought gladly to obey our Lord's command and come with full expectation to God's open house of mercy. Gracious God, we love and adore you in Christ our Lord. We thank you for reconciling us to yourself in him. We rejoice in being received as your children. Prepare us by your Holy Spirit for the sacrament. Help us to come in the assurance that by it we shall be spiritually revived and strengthened in faith, hope, and love through Christ our Lord. Amen. It's a long preparation form, but it's very well worded and good. Brothers and sisters, I'll ask you to stand now in body or in spirit for the benediction. May the holy wisdom of God guard your ways and guide your paths. May the living truth of God enlighten your hearts and open your minds. And may the living spirit of God give you life and life to the full. And all God's people say Amen.
what truth can calm the troubled soul.